For those of you who uh, have been baptized for a period of time, I'd like you to think back to the day of your baptism. How well did you foresee the course your life would take up to today? Perhaps you've been around long enough to remember the days when it was commonly believed that Jesus Christ would return long before the end of the 20th century. Those who can remember that, and I certainly can, know that we felt we had some very solid reasons for that belief. And at the same time, we probably had some uh, ideas about what the church would go through as we came up to those days. We envisioned persecution from religious authorities against the church. We probably expected that there would be a significant number of Christians isolated in some form of place of safety, receiving their final instructions for the kingdom of God. Oh, and we also thought there would be two witnesses thundering out God's condemnation on the false prophet and the beast. We imagine a world racked by disease and war and natural disasters just before Jesus Christ appeared above the Mount of Olives. Were we wrong? Well, yes and no. All of those things are still a part of the prophecies that God inspired, so we were and are right about those. Our timing was a little bit off. Instead of those events happening 25 or 35 or 45 years ago, they're still ahead of us. How far ahead, no one of us really knows. Even today, how many times have you looked at the events of the world around us and thought it must be getting close to the end because it just can't get much worse? But society stumbles on and it gets steadily or perhaps unsteadily worse in spite of our judgment. What is considered normal today would have been unthinkable just a few years ago. And even though God gives us a picture of what lies ahead, sometimes it seems like we're looking through a telephoto lens where you might clearly see what's ahead, but trying to judge the distance between here and there or between the other events in that lens can be quite a challenge for us. Living with that reality could easily make a person begin to question and then to doubt whether those events would ever actually come about. Many professing Christians down through the ages have come to the conclusion that those prophecies that we read are really just kind of metaphors, kind of a description of the ultimate triumph of good over evil. And they set them aside, believing that we don't need to give any more credence to those than we do the stories of Chicken Little or the tortoise and the hare. But knowing that human tendency, God established a method for keeping those prophecies and promises fresh in the minds of his people. Every year we go through the annual Holy Day cycle and we have those meanings of those Holy Days refreshed in our minds and we're reminded of the certainty of God's plan. Reminded that his plan is on track, it's on time, God is still in control, and his promises are still absolute. Those who keep the holy days are assured of the reality of those prophesied future events and where we're heading. Those who abandon the keeping of the holy days have no such reminder. And for them, the powerful meaning of those days withers up and disappears. And even our modern history has shown us that that happens. To be effective, the awareness of where we are, where we've been, where we're going in that plan needs to be constant before us. Not just a singular event that we observe and then it quickly passes and we leave it behind as our daily lives hurtle on into the busyness that this world places before us, a world that doesn't know God. 
We remember that prophecy even tells us that those living in the end times would find their normal day-to-day lives so filled with busyness that it would be easy for them, even converted Christians, to be continually distracted by the world around them and lose sight of the lessons that we need to keep before us in order to reach the destination that God set before us. After all, the God of this world doesn't care what distracts us as long as we remain distracted. Were you aware that this next Wednesday is a special day? It's day 25 in a 50-day journey from the wave sheaf offering on the day after the Sabbath during the days of unleavened bread to the day of Pentecost, 25 days in the future. In other words, we will be halfway to our next important junction in this annual journey through the Holy Days. With all that's going on today, you've probably heard people say they can hardly wait till everything gets back to normal. That's not necessarily a bad thing, as long as what we mean by normal is our ability to worship God without fear or constraint in any way. But on the other hand, in many ways, this world is never again going to be what it was three months ago. So you've probably heard a new phrase Mr. Horchak just used it a moment ago, the new normal. The idea behind the new normal is that some things have changed and we're going to have to get used to living a different way as we go forward, a different paradigm of what constitutes normal in the Christian life. But if we think about it, this certainly isn't the first time we've ever been called upon to encounter a new normal. Some of those changes that have been in our lives have been good, some not so good. 9-11 changed the way that people travel. Most of us don't particularly like what's happened, but we understand, we cooperate, we recognize that new normal is a necessity in a world that we have today. But on the other hand, we've all also had life events that have produced a new normal for us that have been very positive. Events like graduating from school, getting married, having a child, for some, retirement. There are also many biblical examples of people having to adjust to a new normal. Again, some of them positive, some of them not so much so. Adam and Eve leaving the Garden of Eden certainly had to adjust to a new normal. It wasn't a better normal, but they had to adjust to it. Noah and his family leaving the ark after a little over a year inside of it in quarantine. Uh, Sometimes people have said, well, you know, in the Bible, quarantine separates the sick people, but the normal people get to go on and do whatever they want to do. No, not really. There are times when God quarantines the healthy people to protect them from the contamination of the world around them. Noah and his family were in quarantine for a little over 370 days. And the new normal they faced when they came from the ark was very different. Then of course, we find the story of Joseph, whose normal was to be a spoiled rich kid, who then ended up with a new normal of being a slave in Egypt, and then a new normal of being promoted, and then a new normal of being in jail, and then a new normal of being promoted. Interesting life Joseph had. Israel leaving Egypt after two centuries of slavery certainly was entering a new normal. Israel entering the promised land after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, a new normal. The list could be quite long and it certainly includes examples from the New Testament as well. And ultimately, the greatest new normal is going to take place after Jesus Christ returns, at least for you and me, as we enter into a new life that's going to be very, very different than what we have now. We know that the Apostle John in 1 John 3 and verse 2 wrote, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we'll be like him, for we'll see him as he is. We try to wrap our minds around what that new normal will be like, and I'm sure we all look forward to it and know it will be a very positive one. But it's difficult to really imagine fully what that's going to be like. So today in the message, I want to focus on one of those transitions that relates to where we are in our annual journey through the Holy Days. 
There's one thing I hope will be clear in all of these transitions we talk about. The new normal was not what anybody expected it to be. And that leads me to an important personal question for each of us. Is my new normal a godly new normal? This coronavirus pandemic has confined all of us to our homes at a time that we normally would look forward to being together. It is a time when we spend a good bit of time in introspection, and yet it's a joyous time. We enter into the festivals of the first month with a very deep, serious examination of our own spiritual condition and the various aspects that make up our spiritual life. We voluntarily humble ourselves in preparation for the Passover. And then, through washing one another's feet, we humble ourselves, following the example of Jesus Christ's own humility, teaching us that the humility is not just a temporary condition, but it's what enables us to serve one another willingly. We normally leave the Passover service somewhat humbled and yet at the same time grateful for the promises of forgiveness that we've been reminded of and the privilege of even being numbered among those who are the believers. It's always fascinated me that 24 hours later, we gather together, hopefully still bringing with us that same spirit of humility, and we share one of the most enjoyable and uniting nights of the entire year in the night to be much observed. And it is that same spirit of humility that we bring with us the next day as we gather for services, and we are reminded of the need to be vigilant against the constant encroachment of sin and the need to daily be ingesting the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. While we understand that this year we had to celebrate differently, and we all did our best to make these celebrations special, if you were like my wife and me, we probably did so with a little bit of wistful sadness that we had to be separate and not be able to enjoy that special time together. This year, during the Days of Unleavened Bread, we were given the gift of three Sabbaths, three special opportunities to have our minds focused on the lessons that God wants his people to learn through these days. Then sundown came on Wednesday evening, and the days were over for another year. And this strange new version of normal life resumed as our lives went forward. But we're left with some questions, important questions. Was God's purpose for the Days of Unleavened Bread accomplished in my life this year? Other than the obvious outward restrictions on, that the physical world has imposed upon all of us, um, is my spiritual life any different now, or have I returned to what was normal before that period of humbling and introspection and learning? When we think about it, we know that every time we observe God's holy days, we are expected to grow, and that that growth is in fact cumulative, based upon what I learned before. It's not a singular event that stands there and is isolated, and then I go forward without any impact. It's supposed to change me, make me a different person. So as we are now approximately halfway to our next spiritual holy day, Pentecost, how are our lives different? What lasting impact has this year's observance of the Days of Unleavened Bread had in our lives? And how could that impact our approach to the holy day that we see coming over the horizon. As I was preparing this particular sermon, I thought it might be a good time to consider the biblical accounts of lessons that God's people have learned in the period of time between Passover and the, um, the Feast of Pentecost. It may be surprising to learn that there are at least four different accounts that specifically refer to this period of time. The first, of course, is the obvious one that all of us would automatically think of, Israel coming out of Egypt and uh, moving toward Mount Sinai, where they received God's terms of the special covenant that he would make with them. 
And we'll come back to that one in a moment. The second is actually found in Joshua chapters 5 through 7, where Israel had seen the miracle at Jericho, which some traditions teach actually took place on the last day of unleavened bread. But then, very shortly, they suffered the embarrassing and painful defeat before the tiny little city of Ai. And in that period of time, they learned important lessons about pride, about the impact of hidden sins like those of Achan, and the importance of respect for what God says is holy. The third account is probably one that likewise you would think of. It's covered at the end of each of the four Gospels and on into the beginning of the book of Acts. That period of time between the death of Jesus Christ and the founding of the church in Acts chapter 2. As you study those passages as well, they can teach us some important lessons about God's promises, gentle forgiveness of those who've disappointed us, and staying focused on the right things. It is in that section that we find what we call the Great Commission at the end of Matthew 28 that tells us here's the marching orders for the rest of the time before Christ's return for what the church is expected to do. Acts also tells us that what Jesus Christ taught his disciples during that period of time was about the gospel of the kingdom. He showed the focus that we're supposed to have. The fourth account you might not think of, it occurs in Acts chapter 20, where Paul and his companions observed the days of unleavened bread in Philippi, and then set sail for Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost. Along the way, he stopped at Miletus, summoned the elders from Ephesus, and told them he knew that chains awaited him in Jerusalem, and gave them the sober admonitions to keep a watch on themselves, on their own lives lest they become tools in undermining the faith of God's elect. There's some fascinating lessons as you look at those four different accounts. We certainly don't have time to cover all of them today, but studying them as we move between Unleavened Bread and the Feast of Pentecost can teach us some very important things. In each case, the events that are described precipitated what would be called a new normal, a different way of doing things for those who were involved. But such sermons do have a time limit, which is a blessing. Let's just consider one of those. Let's look at a portion of that very first account of Israel as they shook off the chains of slavery and discovered what the new normal of godly freedom would look like in a very, very practical way. It's interesting that Greg turned to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I didn't realize he would do that, but it's fine. We didn't even use the same verse, so that's fine. Uh, But those first few verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 10 actually tell us that we're supposed to learn from the example of Israel during this specific period. Notice beginning in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 1. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 1. Paul writes, moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Now, if you read through the Exodus account, you will see that all of those events took place during that portion of the journey between the time they left Egypt and the time they came to Mount Sinai, between Passover and Unleavened Bread and Pentecost. Because we've believed, and again, I don't know that we can fully prove it, but we've believed that the crossing of the Red Sea traditionally took place on the last day of Unleavened Bread. And the Jewish tradition that the Ten Commandments were spoken from Mount Sinai on the day of Pentecost certainly has some validity to it as well. But interestingly, Paul goes on to show that in spite of God's miraculous interventions during that period of time, Israel failed to trust him and to learn the lessons that he was trying to teach them. Drop down just a few verses to verse 11. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. 
Now, all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. We're supposed to learn from those. And then he draws a conclusion, a logical conclusion. That's why the word therefore is used. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. There's an indication there, and obviously, since he says these instructions are given as an admonition to those upon whom the ends of the ages have come, those are the same ones who need to take heed lest they fall. These lessons are for us. We're supposed to learn something from them. So what are the parallels with our lives today? The Israelites were certainly happy about leaving the rigors of slavery in Egypt behind them. They were excited about what the future was going to hold. Undoubtedly, every one of them had tried to imagine what life would be like in this wonderful land that they'd heard about but never seen. You can almost imagine them lying awake at night in their houses or around campfires talking with each other, speculating, imagining what I'm going to do when I get there, what my freedom will be like, what this new normal will be. They knew where they were going. They were going to the land of the Canaanites and Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Specific location, just about 250 miles to the northeast of where they had been for all those years. They probably had a good idea of the route they would take, probably had a good idea how long it would take them to get there. And probably as the reality of leaving Egypt began to set in with them, they must have frantically started preparing for that journey that they had ahead of them. They realized that whatever they would need for that new land, they have to carry it with them. And they also have to realize that some of the things they had enjoyed where they were would have to be left behind because they're going to enter a new way, a new way of life a much better version of normal, but some things have to be left behind. Probably painful to leave some of those things behind as pioneers traveling from one place to another have often found, but every decision they made had to be guided by the knowledge of where they were going, what the land would be like, where the goal was, and what they would need when they got there. They'd never have an opportunity to come back and pick up something they forgot. If they tried to haul something they didn't need, it would be too much. They'd have to abandon it on the way. But as we know, and they didn't, the journey wasn't quite what they expected. First of all, God had told Moses back in chapter 3 that as a proof of God's backing, Moses should bring all of the Israelites to worship God at Mount Sinai. We don't know if Moses told them about that little detour, but we do know that when God told Moses, don't go the way of the Philistines, lest the people see war and are frightened and want to turn back, that Moses took a detour, apparently headed south along the Red Sea. And you have to wonder if they looked at that and wondered, what in the world is this Moses doing? Does he really have the ability to get us where we're going? We know where we're going. We know how to get there, but he's taking a different route. And I just have this mental image of some Israelites standing at the crossroads and saying, but I thought it was that way. As an aside, some of you may be familiar with a new movie produced by a gentleman named Tim Mahoney, who is attempting to show that uh, the Exodus was, in fact, a real event. My wife and I went and saw the first half of that a couple of months ago, and I would have to say, unfortunately, the conclusions he's beginning to draw are not ones that I could really support. Uh, but uh, I appreciate his effort. He's trying to show that the Bible is, in fact, true. Exodus chapter 14 gives us the amazing story of Israel's crossing of the Red Sea. Now, some have tried to diminish the majesty of that story by pointing out, well, the Hebrew word for Red Sea, Yam Suf, can mean Sea of Reeds, and they're absolutely correct. It can. Not a problem with that. They're correct. 
The Red Sea is mentioned 26 times in Scripture, and 24 of those are in the Hebrew Scriptures. And in each case, Yam Suf is the term that's used. But it's also interesting to note that there are two times in the New Testament, once in the book of Acts in chapter 7, once in the book of Hebrews, where the term Red Sea also exists. God preserved that term in Greek. The Greek term is erythra talosa. Talosa means sea, and erythra means red. Doesn't mean reed. Reed is kalamon, entirely different word, doesn't look like erythra. So God has preserved the fact that it was in fact the Red Sea that the Israelites crossed. The crossing of the Red Sea started a whole new chapter of life for those refugees who had become, over a very short period of time, the tribe and ultimately the nation of Israel. When those former slaves climbed up on the shore, they finally left Egypt and their Egyptian oppressors behind. The account concludes with the destruction of the Egyptian army, the bodies floating on the seashore. Coupled with the death of the firstborn in the 10th plague, Egypt was dealt such a devastating blow. They didn't recover for over two centuries. In the process of relieving those Israelites of their slavery, he also gave them some special protection. Chapter 15 records a very powerful hymn in praise of God for his unmistakable intervention. At that point, there was no one standing around saying, Moses, why did you part the sea and kill all those poor Egyptians? Everybody knew who was responsible for the miracle that had taken place. I think it's hard for us even to imagine what it must have been like as the sun set on that final day of unleavened bread over 3,500 years ago. But the scripture shows that three days later, three days without fresh water, and they were on the verge of losing everything. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in an environment like that, if you've ever been in a place where it is extremely dry, a desert place. Um, you understand that three days without fresh water almost puts you in a panic. When your children are saying, Daddy, I'm thirsty, and you don't have anything to get them, yeah, you can really get very much upset. So it's not hard to imagine that the Israelites were very upset when they encountered water, but it was useless. Brackish water that they couldn't use for themselves or their, their flocks. So what did God tell Moses to do? Moses, there's a tree over there. I want you to throw that in the water. Now, that would have sure convinced me if I were an Israelite who was upset. Uh, kind of a strange thing to ask someone to do. But that's what Moses did, exactly what God told him to do. And we're told the water, instead of being useless and brackish, was sweet and usable for all that they needed. Solve the problem? No. Read a little further. Very quickly, they were complaining to Moses about a lack of food. So Moses went to God, and God gave them quail and manna and a test of obedience a test which a number of them promptly failed because they lacked the trust in God. Now, they probably didn't see it that way. They just probably figured they knew more about gathering manna than Moses did. And so the story goes onward. There isn't time to examine all the lessons that are included in those chapters between Exodus 13 and Exodus 20. When Israel for the first time met the almighty God. But there were many important spiritual lessons along the way. At the same time, I think we would be spiritually dull if we didn't at least take a moment to stop and consider the parallels between what they went through and the journey that you and I are spiritually upon. Just like Israel, we have known from the beginning what our final destination is going to be. Like Israel, we have tried 
with only limited success to imagine what it's like, what it's going to be like to be totally free from the pulls of Satan's world and live in the new normal of that new world. Though much of it's beyond our capacity, I'm sure we all would agree it's going to be a lot better than it is today. Like Israel, we have learned that leaving Egypt, not as easy and as quick as we thought it might be. We've learned that spiritual Egypt and the ruler of spiritual Egypt don't like to release their slaves any more than the Pharaoh and the physical Egyptians did. Just as Israel had to learn to trust God, to walk by faith and not by sight, even when it seemed hopeless, we're having to learn the same thing. We're having to learn firsthand that walking by faith is a lot more difficult than talking about walking by faith. And perhaps most important of all, we've had to learn that the journey is a lot different than we imagined it would be when we started down that path. Through the years, as all of us have gone forward, God has led us at times through wilderness. I've always been fascinated by one of the terms that's used. The, the Bible actually uses, I, I, Hebrew uses a number of terms to describe the wilderness, but to me, one of the most colorful is a waste howling wilderness. Sometimes God's led us through a waste howling wilderness, as he did Israel. And yet, one of the things that we've learned in that process is that he's never abandoned us. In fact, it is sometimes in the midst of the wilderness that we've been blessed to learn lessons that we could never have learned anywhere else. That's not the journey that I imagined when I made my baptismal commitment those years ago. But it's been the right journey for me, and I think for you too. The goal for Israel, the promised land, and the goal that God offers us, the kingdom of God, never changed. God fulfilled his promise to Israel. He brought them into the promised land, and it was far better than anything they could have imagined. In the same way, God's going to fulfill his promise to us, bring us into his kingdom and his family forever. If Israel had lost sight of that goal, and sometimes they came pretty close to losing sight, but there was Moses who had that goal. If they lost sight of the goal, to be honest, they would have disappeared into the sands of the Sinai. We've never heard of them again. Likewise, it is the goal that God sets before us that keeps us going on the long, unexpected, strange journey into his kingdom. Every year as we make our annual journey through God's holy days, each in its proper order, God reinforces for us his promises, reminding us that as long as we faithfully follow where he leads, we'll reach the destination. In a sense, each holy day is a segment of a much larger map that only becomes clear when we put all of it together. Each of the holy days stands, in a sense, as a marker along the way, pointing us in the right direction in order to help us reach the final destination. None of them stands alone as if we could make it that far and then stop and rest for a while. Each one points us forward to the next and the next until we complete the entire cycle. We cannot choose to keep one and ignore the others. We can't choose to keep the fun ones and do I really have to keep the Day of Atonement? Yeah, all of them are necessary. We can't choose one or the other. Each day imparts to us something unique, something we're going to need in order to make it to the goal that God sets before us. So 
with that in mind, what did this year's observance of the Days of Unleavened Bread do for us? What impact did it have on the way I'm living my life now, three and a half weeks later? What have we learned by this observance? And what's God provided for us as we look forward? We all learn various lessons each year. Do you find any leaven this year? Well, then there's probably a lesson there. Are you still eating of the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth? Because that wasn't supposed to stop when sundown came, the end of the days of unleavened bread. How will I be transformed by that experience? The world that we live in is certainly being transformed, but it seems it's becoming a bitter world instead of a better world. More divided, more angry, more suspicious when this, than when, that it was when this all began. Has that mindset began to seep into any of us? After all, we encounter the same frustrations and challenges as the rest of the world does. Both the nightly news and social media confirm that in many ways we are fully engaged in a dialogue of the deaf. People sometimes, people, sometimes even church people, hold firm opinions and hurl videos and articles and graphs that support their opinion while completely ignoring the videos and articles and graphs that say just the opposite. And everyone's so sure they're right, they can't even consider that they might be wrong. And in some cases, might not even realize they don't know enough to have a valid opinion. I'm going to insert something here that'll surprise the translators. Sorry, guys. But I had a story I wanted to insert here because it fits there. In March of 1979, some of you will remember that time, there was what is considered the most serious nuclear accident that's taken place on American soil, as there was a partial meltdown of the number one reactor at Three Mile Island in southeastern Pennsylvania. We have a local member in the congregation here in Dallas who lived within sight of that cooling tower at that time, and she said it was a terrifying time. For a very short period of time, there was a, uh, a great deal of concern. They managed to get things under control. It is my understanding that particular reactor has never been used since then. But it created quite an uproar in the country of concern about the use of nuclear power. In fact, there was a demonstration over two, of over 200,000 people in Washington, D.C., saying we should not have nuclear power. And it did set back the use of nuclear power in this country for decades. Shortly after that, uh, my wife and I lived on the other end of Pennsylvania at that time, and when we had youth activities, YOU activities, as some of you will remember, we often went down in the direction of Washington, D.C. I believe Mr. Salyer was there at that time. Mr. Horchak may have been there at that time as well. Uh, but I remember one particular activity who we went down to Frederick, Maryland, and it was a, just a basketball activity. And uh, as we were there, I happened to see a young man that I had known when we were in San Francisco young man who had gotten a degree in nuclear physics, and uh, he was hired by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in Washington, D.C. And so I was glad to see, we sat down and chatted for a few moments, and after a few moments he said, so tell me, what do you think? Should we use nuclear power or not? And I told him, I said, you know, I've done quite a bit of reading about this, and I've come to the conclusion that I don't know enough to have a valid opinion. And he looked at me, was kind of puzzled, and he said, you know, I don't mean anything disrespectful. I, I respect your, your, your uh, education and so on. But he said, you're absolutely right. You really don't know enough to have a valid opinion. But he said, of all the people I've ever asked, you're the only one who ever said that. Well, now I'm not patting myself on the back. There are a lot of things I don't have a valid opinion about. But I wonder, 
in an opinionated world, in a world where opinion is exalted above the facts, do I ever stop and say, you know what, I don't think I know enough to have a valid opinion about that. We're in a world where opinion is exalted. Sometimes it appears that the most tragic casualty from this experience will be rational thought. But to be fair, rational thought was in crisis before this virus ever came on the scene. But again, the God of this world doesn't really care what we argue about as long as we keep arguing and growing more suspicious of one another. How does the mind of Christ see this world? Let's turn back to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 35. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. It's early in the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ, and it tells us here in verse 35, Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Okay, that tells us what he did. The next verse begins to tell us what was in his mind. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Sheep are very dependent animals. They need a shepherd to be able to protect them, to lead them, to take them to safe places where they can prosper and grow and be able to produce as they need to. And sheep don't have a shepherd, they're lost, they're frightened. They live in a constant state of fear. Jesus looked at people and he said, they're like sheep without a shepherd. And he was moved with compassion. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. He was moved with compassion and his solution for the problem was, these people need shepherds. Pray to God that he'll provide more shepherds. The same way of thinking is actually described centuries earlier by the prophet Jeremiah. If you'll turn back to Jeremiah chapter 13, and I read three verses there. Jeremiah chapter 13, I, I love the book of Jeremiah. To me, Jeremiah is a, is a man of deep emotion and he expresses it well. Jeremiah 13, and we'll start in verse 15. He says to the people of Israel, hear and give ear. Do not be proud, for the Lord has spoken. Give glory to the Lord your God before he causes darkness, before your feet stumble in the dark mountains, and while you're looking for light, he turns it into the shadow of death and makes it dense darkness. But if you'll not hear, if you'll not hear it, my soul will weep in secret for your pride. My eyes will weep bitterly and run down with tears because the Lord's flock has been taken captive. One of the first scriptures I remember memorizing as a child was the old famous John 3:16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now I know that passage has been abused a lot of times, misunderstood. I certainly misunderstood it as a child. But it's a very powerful passage about the attitude of Jesus Christ and of God the Father toward mankind. And as I read a few verses beyond verse 16, I was struck by what I saw about the mind of Jesus Christ, the mind that's supposed to be in us, the mind that is symbolized by the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. In verse 17, the next verse, it says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. If Jesus Christ did not come to condemn the world, would the mind of Jesus Christ in me cause me to condemn the world? 
That doesn't mean we approve what's going on in the world. It doesn't mean that we agree with what they're doing. But our focus, our mindset, is not primarily about condemnation. The ninth plague upon Egypt was the plague of darkness. During that plague, God drove out the darkness and gave his people light. You and I live in a world that's suffering from spiritual darkness, and yet God has given us light. But he hasn't given us light just so we can have it. We're supposed to use that spiritual light to examine, to evaluate, to change our lives. The next few verses there in John 3 help to explain that. He says in verse 18, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the name, which again, understand means the character of the only begotten son of God. You don't believe in that character, then you're already self-condemned. But he goes on verse 19, and this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and doesn't come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth, practices the truth, lives the truth, comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they've been done in God. It's not a matter if the person comes and says, look at me, God, I'm doing good deeds. It's a matter of bringing my deeds before God and saying, look at this, God, is, is this right? Am I doing this the right way? Am I approaching it as I should? Certainly the days of unleavened bread should have made us aware of sin and its pervasive nature. We should be more alert to its presence and vigilant to keep it out of our lives. But we should also be bringing with us the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. The bread that shows us more the mind of Jesus Christ and makes us long to have that mind all the time. What are you bringing with you for this year's journey between the days of unleavened bread and Pentecost? After all, we've already crossed half that journey. We're halfway there. What do we bring with us in that process? What have you determined you gotta leave behind? Just like ancient Israel, that judgment is based on how clearly, how fully we understand the journey that's before us and the goal that waits at the end of that journey. What do we need to bring with us in order to arrive at the goal? Are we walking in faith where the mind of Jesus Christ leads? Are we stuck at the crossroads saying, but I thought it was that way? Better understanding of sin is certainly good, but if we're not also changed by the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth, then we may have missed a very important lesson, maybe the most important lesson. As we move through the annual spiritual journey toward Pentecost and the promises that God places before us, let's make sure our new normal is consistent with God's version of what should be the normal way of thinking and living for the sons and daughters of God.